Hi. I just wondered what, I wondered if there'd be any graphics on the, <laughs> on the board there, but I... <laughs> Let's see, and I don't have a slideshow for you, I'm afraid. I so I just, I want to start with just this most powerful of three-letter words. Right. Sex. 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 <laughs> yeah. So... Just notice, as I, as I say it, notice what happens. Notice what happens in your body. Sex. Notice what kind of associations you have, what kind of imagery you might have. Notice whether they're primarily positive associations and imageries or negative associations and imagery. Or maybe a mix. Because as soon as we broach this subject... As soon as we, we raise the, the word sex, there's a lot that comes into play. There's a lot of charge around this term. And that's why actually I'm really happy to be here speaking about it. And it's also why I'm kind of nervous to be speaking about it. I'm nervous because I've had some experiences of doing this before and seeing, whoa, and seeing what happens. How much comes alive for people? Right? It's a realm where there's so much potency and charge and so much depth and beauty and possibility and often a lot of difficulty and hurt and wounding. And so in speaking to the whole subject today, I want to really be sensitive to the whole variety of experience that might be in the room here. And it's not like I'm proposing any particular answers in any way, right? But rather hoping to share my own ongoing curiosity about this with all of you. And uh, uh, like Kate was just saying, I'll also offer an unplugged session to continue the conversation about that afterwards. I remember that kind of urban myth about uh, the idea that I heard you know, a couple of decades ago at least that men think about sex every seven seconds. Did you hear that? And I wondered even at the time, like how, how would anyone know or, me- or be able to measure that? And yet it's actually a little different now because the internet gives us a way to measure where our attention goes. Right? And to the extent that the internet is like a mirror of our collective attention and we can see where it goes. So according to Gizmodo, In 2010, 12% of all websites were pornographic websites. 25% of all search engine requests were about sex. And 35% of every bit and byte downloaded in 2010 was sexual content. So that's a lot of attention, right? (laughs) That's a lot of attention going there. And, you know, I hope, I feel like I've got a lot of your attention right now. I mean, that's one thing I've noticed talking about sex. People don't nod off in my Dharma talks when I talk about (laughs) this. It's like, even though I flatter myself that I can be vaguely interesting around compassion and emptiness and impermanence, there are often one or two who don't seem to... But talk about sex and, oh, we wake up because there's a lot of charge. And yet, given, and so given how much attention goes there, we might assume, given that Dharma is about bringing awareness to whatever arises in consciousness, bringing awareness to where our attention goes, we might assume that, well, there should be a lot of Dharma teachings about sexuality, sexual energy, sex. But... Of course, many people have told me that they've, ne- they've never heard any useful, frank teachings about sex. And a friend who recently searched Dharma Seed, which is an online database of a lot of Dharma talks in the Insight Meditation and Theravadan tradition, found of the tens of thousands of talks on there, three. Three talks about sex. So there's... There's a, big, there's a big gap there. There's a big split. There's a big separation. There's a big just non-dealing with it. 
a little bit about how this came alive for me. Some, some years ago, I noticed that after 20 years or so of meditation practice and Dharma inquiry, and the ways in which that had freed up so much of my life, and the, and the way in which I felt so much more able to more fully inhabit and allow my experience, that actually when it came to sex, that didn't seem to be the case. And the kind of the insecurities as a lover and the grasping uh, uh, after particular aspects of experience and basically the complexity of my mind and the intensity uh, and the confusion and the struggle that I'd been used to back before I started practicing, even though that had transformed in so many areas of my life, didn't seem to have made a great deal of difference when it came to the realm of sex. And... I also noticed, in a way that was actually really shocking for me, I noticed that I was homophobic as well. And it wasn't that I was homophobic outwardly. I had plenty of uh, good, warm relationships with uh, friends, with gay friends, men and women, in my friends and my family. But, and as I say, it was shocking for me to realise it, I I saw that I was homophobic inwardly. Like, I was really fine with anybody else being gay, but if I, was to have, if I was to be sexually attracted towards men, that really wouldn't be okay. That would somehow mean something less manly or something weak about me in some way. And it was, it was shocking and painful for me to realize that that, were, that that view was quite entrenched in me. And so as I, uh, as I explored that and opened it up and got really curious about it, what happened is I realized I, st- I felt like I couldn't, it didn't really fit for me actually anymore to identify as heterosexual. And so I started to have a sense, and it might, feel, it might sound contrived in some way, but I started to identify as theoretically bisexual. <laughs> because actually, I still, I don't really get attracted to men. Right. But what changed is I was really interested in and open to in a, in a much broader and wider and more inclusive and freer way the, the charge of attraction, of intimacy, of contact and the depth and beauty of that intimacy in the way that it arises. And of course, that's what we're interested in general. That movement towards an intimacy with life. An intimate contact with what's happening here and what's happening here. What's happening in us and between us and around us. To be intimate increasingly with this life is how we might uh, describe the whole of Dharma practice. And then historically, we don't have very good models for that, right? I mean, it's interesting to look at the Buddha's life. The Buddha grew up, actually, with a, as a, you know, in a very hedonistic environment, initially. He says, there is not one sense pleasure I have not tasted. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and then it kind of makes sense that when he had his own existential crisis, that he needed to, the kind of swing from that to uh, the opposite extreme of a great deal of asceticism. And then coming to what he called the middle way, and yet one sees running through Buddhism, and particularly early Buddhism, a strong kind of ascetic ideal, which has a lot of beauty and validity and nobility to it, but it's not, it's, it's not uh, very helpful in the realms of sexuality, right, for us as 21st century lay people who are not living a celibate life. Or if you are, it's probably by circumstance, not by choice. (laughs) So there's one passage in the Vinaya where the Buddha says to, Oh monks, it would be better to put your penis in the mouth of a snake than to put it in another human being. And I I wasn't sure quite what to do with that. (laughs) Unless I thought, maybe maybe the Buddha knows something that I don't. Maybe he means even better. (laughs) 
So, so the tradition can't help us very much in, in the specifics of, how, of bringing our practice into the realms of our sex life, right? of this realm of potency and intimacy, etc. And the other conditioning force on us is uh, the kind of the, the Judeo-Christian religious background that informs so much of our culture, wider cultural attitudes to sex. Cultural attitudes that are uh, shot through with a lot of shame and guilt, the sense of sin, a sense of taboo, a hiddenness, a, a wrongness even. And a lot of the way that that informs uh, the way we hold uh, sex and the discomfort that's often there around it. When Dharma practice engages with our contemporary culture, and Buddhist geeks, for example, in this conference, and, the, and our wider spheres of practice are very much about how Dharma teachings can speak to us about the way our lives are. When Dharma teachings engage uh, themes of thoughts and emotions and habits, they generally engage those themes at a, a more evolved level. They're pointing to a more evolved level of engaging those things than the general cultural level operates at. Right? And yet, when it comes to sex, we seem to mostly just rely on rigid, moral, inherited conventions. Dharma practice asks us to go beyond convention to an authentic, liberated response to life. And we can see, actually, in the last couple of generations, which is the, time that the same time frame that the Dharma has been in the West for, over the last two generations, cultural attitudes towards sex have actually changed and evolved quite a lot. And meanwhile, Dharma teachings around sex, I don't know if I would say they haven't evolved, they just haven't really been there, even. So it's like, it's a real koan for us, actually, to see what would the expression of my sexual life? What would be my, the expression of sexual energy? What would be the way in which I can participate in this intimacy, in this empathy, in this contact with life? If it was liberated from the cultural conditioning of shame and guilt and sin and those associations, and if it was liberated from the egoic conditioning of compulsions and fixations and fears. What might that look like? That's a really that's a that's a an important column. That's a deep question. It's a question that can take a lot of opening up as we confront our various defences around all of this. And maybe by example of some of our defences. No, I I kind of I was thinking earlier. I was considering what it would be like to give this talk in the nude. <laughs> Wait for it, because then I thought, how about if we were all, if I asked you all to be known? So, if you'd all... <laughs> right, but it's an interesting thought experiment, because some of you might, fi might feel completely comfortable and at ease, and some of you might feel actually quite stimulated and excited. But I also imagine that for a lot of you, there would be some insecurity some um, some discomfort, some comparison, some fear of judgment. And that's understandable, right? Partly because we're not used to being naked together, maybe. But also, aren't those same things exactly what's going on in general in life with each other, right? That being, you know, negotiating our insecurities, negotiating our longing for contact, negotiating our sense of comparison and fear of judgment and seeing where we are and what it's like with other people and it's a little tricky sometimes. So actually it might be that being here nakedly together would be exactly the same, just more intensified, more 
naked. And that intensity is important, right? The realm of sex is a really intense realm. It's a really, it's a potent, it's a powerful mirror in which we get to see ourselves reflected back to ourselves. We get to see our insecurities, our vulnerability, our longing for contact and affection and validation and love. And those are the very, uh, that's the very stuff that we're working with in our practice in general. We also get to see in the realm of sex, you know, some sublime aspects of human experience. Love and depth, intimacy and the the dissolution of uh, the sense of self that can happen. The profound sense of non-separation with another. And of course those qualities too are very much the qualities that Dharma practice points us at. A few months ago, uh, I found out that a woman who was on retreat with me was a a rather famous uh, porn actress. In fact, she'd been in a list uh, that, uh, I don't know where it was compiled, of the top ten porn stars in the world at one point, which was kind of interesting to me. I already knew at that point I was coming to give a talk here on this thing. So I thought, so I asked to meet with her. and (laughs) Steady on I asked to meet with her to, to speak about uh, her journey with all of that, which she was very happy to do, and she actually asked if we could film the conversation, which gave me the opportunity to write that great Facebook status that I'm going to make a movie with a porn star. <laughs> but but as, we, as we spoke together, we compared our experience as teenagers with a sense of disillusionment with uh, what the culture around us seemed to be offering, a sense of a longing for depth and meaning in life, a need to remove ourselves from the milieu we'd grown up with, and then finding a practice that was about embodiment, that was about letting go, that was about uh, intimacy, that required an environment that we could really trust in order to allow ourselves to go beyond our familiar experience. And for me, that was a description that took me as a teenager to a monastery, a Buddhist monastery in Asia. And for her, that was a description of a journey that took her into a lot of sexual exploration and uh, making porn movies. But how interesting that that commonality of uh, language around it. And of course, I, 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 it's important to recognise that there's a, there's a whole dark underbelly to pornography, right? And the way that can be very distorting around our sense of sexuality. But that very dark underbelly, that very distortion, is part of the need for us to bring the realm of sex more fully and honestly into the realm of awareness. Just as all the scandals within Buddhist, the sex scandals with with Buddhist teachers and in wider spiritual circles and in all positions of power. And there'll be a panel this afternoon, right, getting a handle on the scandal, looking at recent events with that which I won't speak about, but just as that shows the need to look at this stuff more clearly, fully. And those of you who are up to date with Buddhist Geeks podcasts will have heard Trudy Goodman, uh, I think it was just a week or two ago, speaking about a senior teacher in our tradition saying, mindfulness in sex just isn't possible. Yeah. Because of the potency of desire. But hey, where there's the potency of desire, isn't that just where mindfulness is most needed? Just where the greatest invitation is to be embodied, to be awake. The qualities that we generate in our practice, qualities of awareness, contactfulness, empathy, sensitivity, inquiry, those are the qualities that healthy, exploratory, sensitive, caring, loving sexuality really needs. Last night, Rick uh, Hansen was speaking about uh, the neural, uh, you know, the, the Teflonness of, of positive experiences and how to really reinforce. Uh, positive experience. And he used the acronym of HEAL, those of you who are here, to have to enhance, to absorb positive experiences. And he was saying most positive experiences are like ones and twos on a scale of ten. What about sex? Sex, orgasm, 
That's way up then, close to 10, right? <laughs> Mindfulness in sex is an extraordinary opportunity to have that kind of complete, full body, full energy field experience of delight and bliss and intimacy. To enhance that, to work with it, to allow it, to open it up. I'm being cut off, I've got a, just a minute or two. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of oxytocin and, I just looked this stuff up, oxytocin, dopamine and endorphins that get released in that process. And our practice also encourages us to, you know, mindfulness is very much about, in many ways, recognising our fixations on object and letting go of the object so that we can actually uh, recognise the process, the movement of mind. We... When we see our fixations and compulsions around sexuality, we have the opportunity in letting go of the object we're fixated on to sense more into the the movement, the dynamism, the energy that we might call sex. Except as we do that, we tend to... Sex doesn't seem like quite the right word anymore. We might use the word of eros, the sense of just... of life's own creative, fecund... Uh, fertile, creative energy that moves, that expresses the way in which life is fundamentally intimate with itself. That that creativity, that that movement is what grows these mountains and turns these planets and comes forth as, as this expression of being human. This realm, with all its potency, is a great invitation to us. And it's a tragedy and a limitation and a disservice and I would say even a disrespect to ourselves and each other to leave it out of this practice that we love. So, may all beings be sexually liberated. (laughs) 